real faith produces genuine works. Right from the beginning in this um, whole book, we looked into different kinds of work. We looked into stability in first chapter. We looked into acts of love in second chapter and third chapter. And then we looked into humility in third chapter till fifth chapter. Now in this fifth chapter from seven verses till 20, we are looking into patience, as I told you. So when here the, the, the main crux here is, so when it comes to how we should handle a straying believer, the genuine work prompted by real faith includes not only prayer, but James is telling that we need to intervene. So when we want to handle a backslider, we not only do pray, but we need to sow some action that is intervening. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time. Thank you for leading us in this prayer and also for the message, Lord. Lord, as we meditate on your words, help us to open our hearts, our minds, to receive your words. Implant those words in our heart deep into Lord so that we will never, ever deviate from that Amen. and let them always be in our hearts and minds so that we will be able to exercise them Lord and receive those and put us as salt and light in this world Lord let us be true witnesses to your words guide us you speak Lord reveal us whatever you want to reveal be with us throughout this time. Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 As we continue to look into the book of James, um, thank God like he has led us to finish this book today. These five chapters if you do remember when I started this, this book has got a main theme. Real faith produces works, under which we saw different sections, how the faith in us, the real faith in us produces certain things. And finally, when we come to this fifth chapter, we see real faith produces genuine patience under which we saw certain things. And finally, we have got two verses today. We will be meditating on these two verses, 19 and 20. And what I want to do today is once we finish these two verses, I would go back and we will revisit and I will wrap up the whole book in that way like we will have an idea what we saw all these days and what is the main theme James is emphasizing. So it will be a good wrap up and an understanding for the whole book what we have looked into. To start with today, I will read verses 19 and 20 from chapter 5 of James. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way 
will save them from the death and cover over a multitude of sins. Just two verses, but it has got like a lot of in-depth information in this one. These two verses, I would title them as patience and correction. If you see or if you heard about people who are drowning in the waters and when lifeguards try to save or pull these people out of the water, what happens is, in reality, the person who is drowning in his state of panic and fear, what they do is like they will try to pull the rescuer also into the water. That is that is the psychology or this is what happens on a given situation. The panicky nation, nature, I'm sorry, panicky nature of the swimmer makes the helper also to drown into the water. Why I say is, this is the same true nature of a believer who is attempting to rescue a struggling believer. This is the same thing that is happening. When a believer is wandering away and when other believers or a particular person is trying to rescue the other person, we have to be very careful. Let that person also not get lost into that whirlwind. If you look into or if you do remember the whole theme of this book of James, James is always stressing on one point, on the need for a faith and that faith that works. And also, if you do remember, in every message, when I was taking this particular book, James, I always had this question, what James was asking. If you say you believe like you should, why do you behave like you shouldn't, right? This, this is always a persisting question James is asking to uh, the readers. Now at most, we have come to these two verses, the end of this book. Still, he is stressing on to that same old point. If you say you believe like you should, why do you behave like you shouldn't? See, when, when we started this particular section in the fifth chapter. This particular section, we looked into real faith produces genuine patience. We looked into patience in our suffering, patience in our prayer. Now we are looking into patience, how we want to retrieve a backslider or a person who is wavering in his faith. But before we go any further, we need to clarify what that genuine patience is. Genuine patience is different from passive permissiveness. What I mean by passive permissiveness is as parents, we need to be genuinely loving our kids at the same time disciplining them, right? And when we have that patience, we allow certain times 
when we say to our children to do certain things and not to do those, that there is a discipline there. But we maintain a patience, right? When people, when children always nagging us if they want something, we exercise patience. But when it is passive permissiveness, it is the opposite. If I want to give you two examples, you would understand what I would say. Both are from the Old Testament, the passive permissiveness of parenthood. One is example of Eli. We all know how Eli was and what his job was. And we all know how Eli was treating his two sons. And we all know what these two sons did, totally defying God's word. But Eli never disciplined those two sons. That is is called the passive permissiveness. We have the love, but we don't have the patience. We have the love, but we do not exercise discipline. The second example is David and Absalom. We all know that story. So we have to be clear what is genuine patience and this passive permissiveness is. The reason why I bring this is most of Christian believers have an excuse of patiently waiting on the Lord when they say, is they step back and wait patiently, doing nothing. That shouldn't be. They just say, like, I'm praying, I'm waiting for the Lord to answer, but they will not do anything. That is not genuinely, patiently waiting for the Lord. That is what the whole theme of this book is. Real faith produces work. We need to work and we need to show action and wait patiently for the God to open doors or continue certain works according to his will. It doesn't mean like we have to step back, sit quietly and pray to God doing nothing so he would open doors. That is not going to happen forever for anybody. So let's not forget the theme Real faith produces genuine works. Right from the beginning in this um, whole book, we looked into different kinds of work. We looked into stability in first chapter. We looked into acts of love in second chapter and third chapter. And then we looked into humility in third chapter till fifth chapter. Now in this fifth chapter from seven verses till 20, we are looking into patience, as I told you. So when here, the, the, the main crux here is, so when it comes to how we should handle a straying believer, the genuine work prompted by real faith includes not only prayer, but James is telling that we need to intervene. So when we want to handle a backslider, we not only do pray, but we need to show some action that is intervening. But throughout this process, there is going to be a confrontation and the restoration of that person. And during this time, we should maintain a frame of mind that is patient 
and reliant on God for that particular person to be restored back into track. So we have to be very careful when we want to deal with a believer who have gone astray. We need to pray and we need to have an intervention. And when we do this, we have to have patience and we don't want to look into instant actions or in instant results. So when, when, when we look into these just two verses, there are lots of questions that are being posted by James, right? How we want to deal with this condition? I have, I have got somewhere around like four questions that always comes up when you want to deal with such a person. Is there a time when a Christian believer have to intervene and deal with the sin of another person? The second question is, if you want to intervene, at what point, at what time do you want to intervene? Is it like you're, you're waiting for a certain time of period before you intervene to bring back that believer back into track? So you, you do not know like what, what point you want to intervene. That's, that's the test of patience. Another question is, if you're trying to correct that person, is it going to be just the work of the Holy Spirit? That is by praying. Or should we step into and try to resolve the problem? And if we do so, can we do this without appearing more legalistic or more judgmental? I would say it is more judgmental. So all these questions always pop up when you want to correct an unbeliever. If you look into Matthew 7, 3 to 5, Jesus said, like, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck of your brother's eye. See, this is totally a different scenario or a situation, what Christ is mentioning here. You should have seen certain people who are always critics. They are born critics. Even if they have their own lives in trouble and shambles, and their own perspective is wrong, they still feel it's their duty to pinpoint at even minor flaws in others' life. You would agree with that. You should have seen that. You have come across certain people like that. This is the thing like Christ is condemning of being hypocritically judgmental in Matthew people rush into this practice of being judgmental. But what James is mentioning here is, it's the other way around. He, he, he feels that a person, a believer, who's trying to backtrack and bring back another believer back into track should be a qualified person. A qualified believer who has got a clear vision and who exercise
patience and who is equipped with wisdom and of all should have humility if you look into galatians chapter 612 it's mentioning the same brothers and sisters if someone is caught in a sin you who live by spirit should restore that person gently restore that person gently but watch yourself or you also may be tempted see first james is addressing the situation of believers who have gone astray you have to be very very careful here james is not talking about unbelievers whom we are trying to bring back bring them to salvation but restoring christian believers who have strayed from the truth james is mentioning about wandering from truth right like people can wander from true true from the true truth by two ways they can wander doctrinally or they can wander practically watch carefully like see like there are two ways people could wander like believers doctrinal wandering and practically they are wandering excuse me when i say like wandering doctrinally means people have backtracked or they have gone into wrong beliefs you should have seen like good believers slowly backsliding and moving into other denominations or denominational churches which do not preach the real truth if i want to say uh, most of these prosperity churches that are coming up nowadays they do not teach the truth people who have wandered i have seen like people who have gone into these kinds of churches and fitting so comfortably over there so this is one kind of doctrinal wandering another one what i mentioned is the practical wandering those are very common where people like they fail to align into their practice with their profession what we preach or what we teach we don't practice so that is called as practical wandering but in both these cases the response of the healthy believer should be the same how we need to approach the this person person as we should turn these those who have strayed away the the, the aim is going to be only one like we have to bring back those kind of believers back into track when when i started with the james book i have mentioned about the jewish beliefs they have got like two paths of life they have the, in their beliefs one is path of life and another one is path of death path of life is like re- leading a righteous life but the other one path of death is an unrighteous life like going astray and that path will lead to destruction so believers growing in faith and good works will lead to a life of prosperity but unbelievers they go in the path of death but what happens here in the life of a believer who have gone astray is they have slowly moved into the path of destruction see some believers after making a very good progress in their life going into the path of life they slowly start to backslide heading into the wrong direction so we need to intervene for these people so that these people will be 
helped to avoid the discipline of God. Again, not everyone, I would say like not every believer is equipped with the right attitude for turning this backsliders into the way. So the person who intervenes into the life of these believers should be spiritually mature and they need to be very gentle. And as I told you, like they need to have that wisdom and the humility. Um, they cannot have any arrogance. You cannot have any arrogant behavior in us when we want to correct somebody like this. And you cannot use any harshness. And we cannot use any of our carnality to bring back a believer back into track. So we have to be careful to remove the speck from our own eyes before considering to deal with the speck from another eye. So it also includes a little bit of attitude. So the person should not be considering themselves as more holier. Self-righteousness leads to distraction, you know that. So this interve intervention will do more harm than good when we think ourselves as more holier and then approach a believer who has gone astray. And the second point here is, James uh, is assuring that if we succeed at our rescue operation through whatever I told you, like patience, humility, uh, gentleness, and perseverance, by doing this, what we have done is we have restored the person to the right path. The encouraging result of this restoration is like when we turn that sinning Christian from an error of his way, we will save his soul from death. When we are turning a um, sinning Christian from the error of his way, we will cover a multitude of sins. That's what the verse says in verse 20. We will cover a multitude of sins. It means not only does a person's confession of sin brings forgiveness from the wayward path, but also that prevents that person from continuing further along the dead end path of sin and destruction. The damage that the rebellion, uh, rebellious Christian have done and could still could be covered. If you look into uh, 1 Peter 4, 8, it says the same. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. So the intervention of a loving Christian through prayers, through our patience, and through the perseverance, it not only saves a person accumulating more sin, it also spares the damage of the church also. So patient or patience is not an excuse for passivity. And again, faith is not an excuse for inaction. As I told you, like faith involves action. So if you are considering correcting a backslider with a word of encouragement, we need to check our own motives. We are to be sure we are doing it exclusively and genuinely out of love. And we need to do it fully immersed in prayer and have patience. As you know, like carnality is seen as the death of fellowship with God. And therefore, 
of a spiritual productive life if you have time try to read these verses as we don't have time look into romans 8:6 and first timothy 5:6 a carnal believer is called to rise from the dead and christ will give you light that's what we read in ephesians 5:14 and religious deeds that do not originate from faith and humility we call them as dead works as we read in hebrews 6:1 so if i have to say the application what we get from these two verses watching out for the wayward there are three points i want to mention here there are occasions when we are to be involved in removing the speck from another person's eye helping those people who have gone astray and this entire process must be under the direction and the control of the holy spirit and the third point that motive and the attitude is more important as the action so faithful endurance may deliver others who are wavering so this ends the whole book of james what i would now do is i will go further down and i will try to give you an overall summary from the first chapter what we looked into if you do remember the whole book again i tell you real faith produces works so for our understanding we had four sections we looked into in this book first section we looked into real faith produces stability that is james first chapter from verses 1 to 27 so in that chapter what we did is like we looked into the main theme that is joy in trials and when we face tem- temptations we need to have joy and how we are responding to the word of god and the key terms whatever we used in that particular chapter was trials perseverance and religion the second section real faith produces genuine love that is second chapter from verses 1 to third chapter 12 we looked into this wherein we looked into partiality and prejudice faith at work and how we need to control our tongue whatever we looked into in this section the key terms what we did was how we need to control our tongues and how we are justifying our works the third section what we looked is real faith produces genuine humility that is third chapter from 13th verse to chapter 5 verse 6 the main theme what we looked into is like expressions of the heart and how we settle disputes and expression of our desires and warning to the wealthy <clears throat> and the fourth section what we looked was real faith produces genuine patience so again genuine stability genuine love genuine humility and genuine patience so if you look into the first section real faith produces genuine stability we looked into the trials of life how we need to have endurance during t- t- times of troubles so the cause in that section what we is saw is the wisdom we need wisdom so what we are supposed to do we are supposed to pray and we looked into temptations lust and sin that leads to death that is the cause is deception so what we are supposed to do do the prayer so both these sections either we need wisdom we need to pray and then 
the deception, how to get rid of the deception, again, we looked into how we have to get rid of this, do the prayer. And the applications, what we saw is rising above trials. When trials come, it's essential that we respond with wisdom. If you remember verse Romans 8, 28, all we know is, all things work out in God's sovereign plan for our good, right? So when we have to rise above trials, just trust in him, pray to him. If you read in Hebrews 12, 1, 2, 3, turn, we need to turn our attention on Jesus and other fellow sufferers who have gone before as a model of endurance. That's the gist of these two verses, if you do remember that. And First Peter chapter 6, verse 7, it reminds that endurance will ultimately result in praise, glory, and honor. So when trouble comes, we should respond in faith. Faith means having absolute confidence in God's promise, despite our circumstances. That appears totally contradictory to those promises. Uh, a very good example is Abraham sacrificing Isaac. So the circumstances will defy it, but still we need to rise above the trials. The second section, what we looked into was temptations to sin and the application what we saw was like how victory comes through dwelling in the good and the victory coming through living in the truth and we need to have a cleansed heart and we need to read meditate and memorize on the words and the third section we looked into was how we need to Response, respond to the scriptures, reconciling the separation, how we have to receive and respond to the truth. And if you do remember, I did mention about the soil of our soul, how we need to prepare it to receive the seed of truth to be planted in us. And we looked into the applications, never separate the truth from our speech and never separate the truth and the needs of others and never separate the truth and our upright lifestyles. So to be very just for this one, we have to be swift to hear in trials and let our hearing lead to doing and let our hearing be impartial and merciful and let our hearing lead to faithful action. And the second section is real faith producing genuine love. We looked into how we have to overcome partiality and prejudice. And I, I mentioned prejudice is a sin. So let the scriptures, not our habits, be your standard and let love be our law. And we looked into faith at work. I think like I want to mention it again about this one is the main reason is this section, chapter two, verse 14 to 26, because this is the main section of the book. Because everything before this passage is like an arrow pointing forward to it and everything after this is like an arrow pointing backwards. So James is having two important questions. We had just now looked into it. What use is it if someone, someone says he has the faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? What the good does it when that person doesn't have the work. So we have to 
claim that one. We have to be a part of that one. Like we need to have genuine words too. That faith, that kind of faith um, will not produce any fruit. So we looked into also the four characteristic feature of genuine faith. Genuine faith is not indifferent, but it is involved. Genuine faith is independent, but in partnership. Genuine faith is not invisible, but on display. And again, genuine faith is not intellectual, but from the heart. In this section, uh, James was using two important um, characteristic features and how he was comparing them, Abraham and Rahab. We know Abraham as the father of Hebrews and Rahab, a Gentile, immoral lady. So he was mentioning these two characters. These two characters used to justify by works. Again, um, I want to mention uh, this um, verse, Romans 3.28, because when we say that justified by works, we all have this question, is James contradicting Paul's teaching? What Romans 3.28 says is, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the work of the law. So James here again is not disputing Paul, but it is the same information. It's like two sides of the same coin. Paul is looking at the root of salvation and he is looking at life from God's perspective. The other side of the coin is James is looking at the fruit of the salvation and he is looking at life from human perspective. So faith with no works and work with no faith is not good enough. It's almost like body and spirit. They have to be united or it is dead. Similarly, faith with works is good. Faith without work is dead. So we have to get the message. Do not be deceived by these words, but we have to be very particular in understanding what James is telling. So apart from Christ, we can't, we can't do anything. You all know that. So only with that root of faith, which is firmly planted in us, a life can produce any fruit. And then the third section, what we looked into was how we need to control our tongues. We all know like our tongue is, is uh, it's, it's an un, un, can be an untamed beast. So when we looked into it, I think like we looked into uh, the application, like how the tongue contaminates and how the tongue confronts. So let us be slow to speak in trials. And the third section, what we looked into was real faith produces genuine humility under which we saw like how a wise and an unwise person show different characteristic signs and um, resulting information. If, if I want to put that as a wrapping thing, the signs of an wise person is like he has got a good behavior and a gentle deed, but the signs of an unwise person is bitter jealousy and self-ambition. And the characteristic feature of an unwise person, and that person is arrogant, dishonest, he's so living in carnality, and he's more like a demonic person. But if you look into the characteristic feature of a wise person, is he, he's pure, He's peace-loving, he's gentle, he's reasonable, he's a merciful person, he's a sincere person, and he's a bountiful person. So the resulting thing here is five characteristic feature of an unwise person. If you look into the inner circle, if you can imagine this as an inner circle, this unwise person is bitter, jealousy, 
and selfish in ambition. That kind of a person is so arrogant and so dishonest and living in carnality. You know what happens? This will lead to disorder and evil. I put this disorder and evil in the outer circle. But if you look into the characteristic feature of a wise person, the inner circle, that person is, has, has got a very good behavior and he has got like good deeds to be done. And if he's such a person, look at his character, like he's, he's a pure person, he's a peace-loving person, he's a gentle person, he's a very reasonable person, he's so merciful and he's so sincere. And if that be the case, the outer circle of that person is going to be peace-loving and he's a righteous person. So we want to be sure like what kind of a portrayal we want to be. If we sow peace, we will ha harvest righteousness. And then we looked into the second section in that same book, how fights are start started and stopped. <clears throat> it is all because of our wrong desires. So how to get rid of our envy and jealousiness. That's what we looked into it. And then the third section in that fourth chapter, we looked into the pitfalls of playing God. So two things uh, are mentioned here in that particular chapter, how we view others trying to play God in others' life and how we view ourselves above all other persons. Are we holding ourselves high esteem of ourselves? So we have to be very clear in that one. So in that section, I always mentioned about um, the problems. We as martyrs, we don't have any idea what the future is going to be. And we play when we play God with our own lives, it's so risky because we do not have any assurance and we have no right to ignore all these things and play God in other person's lives too. Um, I, I, I always mention this, and I want to mention this again here. Um, there are four ways how things are done. The first one is our will and our way. This will always lead to disaster. And the second one is our will and God's way. This is also not going to happen. And the third one is God's will and our way. This is also not going to happen except God's will and God's way. When God's will and our will are not the same, you know what we do? We always try to justify why we went away. And when we do this, we fight with God and we get so sad and we have a hurting feeling and we try to always accuse God. So we must know the right thing to do and we must start doing the right thing. And then we looked into the warning of the wealthy in chapter 5, 1 to 6, how a poor physical condition person and he has got a poor spiritual condition, how we need to uh, uh, look into the needs of this kind of person and how a physically rich person and spiritually rich person can provide to other people. And then again, how a poor physical conditioned person with a rich spiritual conditioned person can provide opportunities for the spiritually needed person. So that we looked into it. And then finally, we looked into chapter five, real faith produces real patience under which we try to finish whatever we did. So we're wrapping up all these things. If James has taught us 
anything clear he has made it so clear real faith produces genuine words how well do our actions look into when we mirror ourselves it's the good question we need to ask james when he was mentioning all these things how our actions are supposed to be during trials and how our treatments when they were so less unfortunate how we need to speak and how we need to relate to others and how the money plays an important role in our lives let us contemplate over this and think about what we all saw in the book of james and let us encourage ourselves to do good and do that according to the faith that we proclaim lord help us to demonstrate the power of faith in our lives lord as we face trials every day in our lives help us to have a steady endurance lord let us show the mercy and the compassion as you have shown us lord lord help us to be the doers of the word but not hearers lord you bless us with all the humility and the faith that we need lord as believers help us to act justly to love mercy and walk humbly with you lord you have told that we are salt and light and let us use that and exhibit lord and if that salt has gone waste it has lost its saltness lord it is going into trash and that light that you have lit in us lord that that be a beaming light a witness for people around us lord help us to exercise and let us not live a life as islands separated lord but let us show the love the kindness the gentleness the compassion that you have shown us lord the mercy and the grace you have given us let us show the same thing to our fellow brothers and our brave believers as well lord thank you for going through this whole book and imparting the faith and the work that we need to exhibit lord thank you for your wonderful presence impart these deep in our hearts so that we will be able to exercise this in our day to day life and also impart that to our family members especially to our children lord thank you thank you for hearing this thank you for imparting everything lord in jesus precious name we pray amen amen amen, amen.